Well, it's six o'clock. And for those of you who consistently join our meetings, you're probably wondering where Chris is. Um, he is probably going to join a little bit later. He did have a conflict. Um, and so my name is Mindy Falkowski. I am the vice president of the Encino board and will be um, I'm going to be your Chris today. So I just want to cut full transparency. This is the first meeting that I'm running and I'm not super um, great with technology. So if I might don't, not get to your chat or if I mess something up, I apologize in advance. I do have Thomas Ecker here helping me and letting people into the meeting as well. Um, we have a pretty packed schedule so I'm, and we have some really great speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording, and so if there is any reason why you need to drop off or you want to rewatch this later on, it will be posted on, um, on, our, on, our, on our blog and on the MCNO Facebook page. So just a quick announcement. Um, since the last time we met, we did we had an open position on the um, Mid-City Security District Board, and we have filled that role with Wendy Laker. Um, so it's we, we had a, we had a couple of folks that applied and we were looking to fill more roles later on so i don't know if wendy is joining us today but if she is welcome um our first our first person on the agenda is we have um some joe garuso joe are you ready i am ready uh, i think you did a great job mindy um i, I have this, i have some the same issues with trying to get everybody uh organized on these type of meetings good evening everybody um i'm joe Geruso, um council member district a i know you all have a packed agenda really the main thing i wanted to talk about was something that i uh passed along with my colleagues and so uh, you'll see actually here tonight some folks to talk to you about an upcoming issue while we have been in the emergency uh there has not been a requirement for the neighborhood participation program to meet either telephonically or by video and now that we are over a year into covid and knowing the importance of neighborhood engagement i've asked the city planning commission to not only study um, having video and telephone meetings while we are in the emergency and emerging from it as well, but also other things that we can be doing to make the neighborhood participation program a little bit easier on other people. So that is really the primary thing I wanted to report on. Um, I'm happy to talk about other issues. Um, the only other sort of real big thing I think going on this week, actually too, um, is we're going to have a report from the administration on the uh, on the ARP money, starting to sketch out where that's coming from, and I guess in very broad strokes from the administration what the priorities might look like. And then we also have a public works meeting on Thursday to discuss a few topics, but the principal one is that FEMA work that's going on around the city, how to make sure it's being expedited, how to make sure that's being improved, and then also a little bit of hurricane preparedness along with that as well. So that is my report. I'm happy to answer any questions y'all may have. I'm gonna stick around for a little while, but I do know you have a packed agenda and wanted to get in as much information as I could. One thing I did forget to mention is if you don't feel comfortable asking your question verbally, we do have the chat. Um, I know on some of the invites, it says you can um, fill out a form. That's mainly for pre-meeting. So if you do have a question, you can throw it in the chat or obviously ask it verbally. And I will do my best to get, get to them all that are in the chat as well. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right, I will take silence as a no. And so next up on the agenda, we have um, the UNO flooding and uh, repetitive loss analysis. And I do see Dr. Monica Ferris has joined us. So I am going to attempt to mute myself and give you the floor. You are on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. You would think after we spent our whole lives on Zoom now and whatever else, uh, whatever, whatever the platforms, we would be experts. But anyway, thank you very much for having me this evening. I'm hoping it's okay if I present a PowerPoint. Okay. 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 Are you able to see my screen? 
No, um, I wonder. Let's see. let's see. Chris said that there should you should be able to show it on your own. Like I don't need to give you control or anything. There we go. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. Where it's happening. Right. So, okay. So I'm just trying to figure out how to get my PowerPoint to come up. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure how to. Sorry about this. I'm I'm used to Zoom. Um, Would that work the way it is? Can everybody see that? Can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, Ma yes, Monica, I can see it. Yes. Sorry, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So, um, good evening, and thank you again for allowing us some time to speak to you all this evening. We've been working with the city of New Orleans for the past couple of years on a repetitive loss project. Repetitive flooding is a significant problem for our state and our city. Um, again, I'm Monica Ferris, director of UNO Chart. Very quickly, UNO Chart is an applied social science hazards research center that partners with and supports Louisiana communities in efforts to achieve disaster resilience with a focus on mitigation. Uh, we work in multidisciplinary teams of faculty, staff, and students from various departments across UNO's campus. And in fact, I'm joined today by one of our graduate research assistants, Wong Tao. Um, she's the lead VA on the project and will co-present with me this evening. So thanks for being with me, Wong. Absolutely. Um, in 2016, the city of New Orleans was awarded a $141 million grant from the HUD National Disaster Resilience Competition to design and implement the Gentilly Resilience District that could be replicated in other areas of the city. As the focus of the grant was on stormwater management, funds from that award are being used to conduct this repetitive loss area analysis that we're here to talk to you about this evening. UNO, par UNO Chart partnered with the city's hazard mitigation office to support efforts to reduce damage from repetitive flooding, to plan for mitigation of future flood events, to offer education and outreach to residents throughout the city, and as a final goal, to earn points within the community rating system. And the community rating system is a voluntary program. It's related to the National Flood Insurance Program. And because the city participates at a class eight, um, those of you who are located in the special flood hazard area or the high risk flood area of the city, you would, should get a 10% discount on your flood insurance premiums. And those that are outside of the special flood hazard area could be eligible for a 5% discount. And our partner with the city is Austin Feldbaum from the city's hazard mitigation office, and I believe he's on the call for this as well. But before we get into our analysis, just uh, a quick um, definition of repetitive loss. FEMA actually maintains a list of repetitive loss properties across the country. A repetitive loss property is defined as any national flood insurance insured property where there's been two more claims made of more than $1,000 within any, within any rolling 10-year period. A severe repetitive loss, that list is a subset of the main list. And severe repetitive losses refer to those properties where there have been four more claims of more than $5,000 or more, or at least two claims where you add them together exceed the reported building's value. There are over 34,000 repetitive loss properties across our state, and unfortunately over 6,500 of those properties are found across the city of New Orleans. This number actually underestimates our flooding problem as it only includes those who have flood insurance policies. As these repetitive loss properties can be found throughout the city, the entire city is considered a repetitive loss area by the mitigation office. To make our analysis a bit easier to conduct and for us to better understand flooding issues across the city, we divided the city into 11 repetitive loss districts. And if you might recognize they're made up from the city's 14 planning districts. And you can see the city there with a star. The steps in our repetitive loss area analysis are prescribed by FEMA and include those here on the screen. 
Step one involves notification of the study area. And this was done through the water bills. The city partners with the Sewage and Water Board to send an annual flood flyer, if you will, to send information to all residents uh, within the city about the flooding issues the city has. And the city was gracious enough to include a brief description of our project within um, this flyer, I think for the past two summers. There was also a link shared in the flyer which can take you to the, a part of the city's website where you can find a short description of our project and a link to a survey where we asked uh, residents questions like how long have you lived in your home? Have you ever flooded? If you did flood, how deep was the water? Have you tried to reduce flooding? Did those actions work? And you can, st the survey is still live and we're gonna share the link towards the end of the presentation. The second step is where we review the city's hazard mitigation plan, the code of ordinances, any flood data that may be available, the sewage and water board plans for the city, the national flood insurance program claims data for the city and a lot of other data that could impact flooding throughout the city. Step three involved our team working with the city to collect data on over 125,000 properties across the city. As this analysis does not just focus on repetitive loss properties, but all buildings across the city. Um, step three also included the residential survey. These data were collected to help us make recommendations for appropriate mitigations for each property, and that's step four. And as a final step, we're working on a final document that will include a summary of these steps, as well as what we found per repetitive loss district and our recommendations for pro um, individual properties and for the city. Over the next several slides, Wong will review some of the data we collected through steps two and three for the Mid-City District. Hello, I'm Juan, uh, can you hear me? Okay, I will go over the specific data for your district uh, due to our lot of time and for the sake of brevity, I will just summarize your district data, but uh, we will be glad to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. So um, there are nine neighborhoods um, within the uh, repetitive loss mid-city district. Uh, they are, these are based off the city's uh, GIS maps. Um, you have uh, St. Bernard, you have uh, the fairground, 7th, uh, Bio St. John, Treme, uh, Tulane, Cooper, Jerktown, and of course, uh, you guys, Mid City. Next slide, please. Uh, there are 692 rep loss property in the district and 235 in the Mid City neighborhood. Um, I would like to stress uh, that these are only properties with uh, NFIP flood insurance. Uh, your neighborhood is about 34 of the total district, uh, and your district is about 11% uh, uh, of the whole um, uh, city. Next, please. Uh, these are the insurance claim table um, information. Uh, uh, does not just show the rep loss property, it shows all of the uh, uh, NFIP insurance properties in your district. Uh, the reason why we have divided uh, it into um, all claims and without Katrina claim is because Katrina was such a statistical outlier. So as you can see, uh, the number of claims, um, of all claims is about 12,000. Uh, the average uh, of uh, uh, claims payment is about 62 uh, plus thousand. And it's about um, totaling uh, six, 100 million uh, and 58. Uh, so, uh, and on without Katrina, the numbers drops a little bit, well, a lot actually. So it's the number of all claims is about uh, uh, 4,400 uh, uh, plus. Uh, the average, a lot less, is plus 11,000. And of course, Lee, the total uh, is about 36 million. Next, please. Uh, this table shows the survey data of uh, most of the properties in the uh, um, Mid-City District. Uh, it's not just the repetitive uh, flood loss properties or, or the NFIP properties. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight some of these. Uh, for example, um, there's about uh, almost 15,000 uh, 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 total buildings. Uh, about 90% of them are slab 
and about uh, 54 percent of them or three feet or higher above uh, the ground uh, the graded ground next please uh, here is the firm uh, the flood insurance rated map um, you can see the uh, uh, light blue that's the a zone uh, which is the special flood hazard area um, that means it uh, has, uh, what is it, the 1% or 100 year um, uh, kind of flood. And then you have the gray, which is the X. Uh, it's uh, lower risk. However, it does not mean you should not buy insurance in these areas. Uh, and you can tell it's somewhat dispersed um, uh, in the mid city, your location. Uh, you guys have the bulk of that kind of light blue. Next, please. Uh, this are the flood control measures that are uh, community driven. Um, all works to protect for the 10 year flood. Uh, however, a lot of the uh, rep loss properties come from larger flood, not Katrina level, but larger than the 10 year flood. Um, there are the street uh, drainage, um, uh, and then it leads to the pumps and the uh, sealer. Uh, and then you get the green infrastructure. Green infrastructure are more for everyday um, rain events. And uh, as you can tell, there's on the periphery side, close to the uh, um, uh, uptown area, but unfortunately there's no current project for the CELA within your district. Next, please. Uh, this is the drainage project status that uh, collects rainwater at the street level. Um, so about, um, 60% or plan that's in the blue, uh, about 1% are under construction, that's in the yellow. Um, is that 1%? Yes, that's 1%. And then you have the 33% uh, green, which is completed. So uh, your mid, uh, mid city neighborhood, most of them are planned. Next, please. Uh, this is the larger. Uh, sewage and water board drainage system. Uh, so where it takes the rainwater is then collected and sent to the uh, uh, pump station through larger canals, mains, and, and pipes. Um, I believe there are relatively two large pumps on the uh, uh, more peripheral side, of, uh, up on the north side of the fairground and on the uh, south side part of uh, Cooper. And then Monica will take over the rest. Thank you. Thanks, Wong. Sorry, these were a little out of order. So based on the types of data Wong reviewed, we will make mitigation recommendations for each structure that's part of the analysis, which are most of the buildings across the city. So FEMA defines mitigation as any action that reduces or eliminates long-term risk to property and to people from future disasters. So here we looked at measures that included elevating your home, possible reconstruction of your home, installing a temporary or a permanent barrier like a flood wall, uh, wet flood proofing, which in, this is an example of wet flood proofing here on my screen, where you can see that the washing machine is elevated on this concrete block, um, and so is the water heater. So the idea of this is that you know water will enter maybe um, an above ground basement or just the lower floor of your home, and you'd want to elevate those higher priced appliances or an air conditioner, um, et cetera, to get them out of the way in case floodwaters do enter. Um, of course, drainage maintenance is a mitigation measure. Implementing green infrastructure, as Wong had mentioned, which we see around the city, uh, rain gardens, maybe a rain barrel, installing permeable materials in place of concrete, just a few examples of green infrastructure, and then, of course, flood insurance. And if you do have questions about elevation or reconstruction, um, the potential for funding, that would be a question for Austin, who I'm sure can address that later on in um, the presentation. And Jerome Landry is the city's floodplain manager. And if you had questions about wet floodproofing or drainage maintenance or something specific to your property, um, part of his role is being able to give that type of advice or to send someone from his office to actually do a site visit. So, and I will share his contact information at the end of the presentation. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. So, we hope to work with the city to include the recommendations that we're going to make for each property on the city's Ready for Rain website, which is active now. 
you can simply go to this website, you type in your address and you get risk information for your property and you can get that now. Our data will just be additional to what's already there. What we're hoping is the information that we can add will look something like this, where, you, um, where um, an example might be if the highest flood, not counting Katrina, did not get up to the lowest habitable floor, you may want to consider these options, like wet flood proofing or carrying flood insurance. Whereas here, the highest flood was more, so if you were looking at um, a scenario where you have more than two feet, you would have different choices, such as elevating your um, lowest floor, mitigation reconstruction, or again, possibly wet flood proofing. Um, installing green infrastructure for more of those everyday kind of rain events and making sure catch basins are clear in front of your, your home would be other examples, which I'm sure we've all uh, learned about the hard way um, in these everyday rain events. So as a final step of our project, um, we are hoping to wrap up the survey, which is still active and can be accessed at this website, nola.gov backslash flood study. Um, and there is a link there that will take you to the survey. And then we're wrapping up um, documentation of all of what we found and making those recommendations. We're hoping the final document will be ready for review in May. Um, and we will be glad to share that final document with you all. And it will be posted on the city's website. And I'm going to oh, go to this. And here's our contact information if you have questions about the actual report. Um, you um, feel free to reach out to me. Austin, I think, is on the call, and I went ahead and just put his email address as well as his office number in case you have questions about hazard mitigation or potential funding that might be available. And Jerome Landry, who's the floodplain manager, as I mentioned earlier, and here is his contact information as well. And I'll be glad to share this PowerPoint so that you can have it later. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anything they would like to ask or share? All right. Um, so, uh, Monica, if you want to, if I don't know if you want to share the PowerPoint with um, MCNO, and we can add it into the notes of the the blog, we're more than um, happy to do so. Great, I'll be glad to do that. And thank you all again very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for joining. Okay, so thank for you. those of you who attended last month, we had. Um, Rep Willard was here and spoke a little bit about some of their proposed tax reform that was coming up in this next um, legislative session, which I believe started a couple of days ago. So we actually have a uh, special guest. Um, I've, I've actually seen them a little bit on Facebook and in different um, different avenues, and and they it was quite timely. Um, we have I have uh, Sarah Harbison here from the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining, especially on um, kind of late notice, my 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 fault. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your organization and then um, whatever else we'd like to share, maybe about the tax reform. Sure, I'm happy to. And thank you so much for having me, Mindy. Um, I'm general counsel at the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. Um, I'm a lawyer, so I do want to uh, preface my comments by saying that um, I don't live, breathe, and uh, immerse myself in tax reform every day. Um, I was available this evening. So um, Daniel, who's our CEO, who does actually live and breathe tax reform, um, would normally be giving this presentation. So um, if you have any questions that I'm unable to answer, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box. And if I can't answer it, we'll get somebody um, who can get an answer for you. And Mindy, as you mentioned, the legislative session actually started um, today. And um, it's there are several, and I wrote down a few of them of note, um, some tax reform efforts that have been um, proposed by the legislators. And I can drop those bill numbers in the chat as well. Um, at the Pelican Institute, uh, we're, we're a think tank. And I am the director of the Litigation Center. 
Um, we're all concerned that um, too many of our friends and family members are having to leave Louisiana for jobs and opportunities in other states. Um, we have wonderful natural resources. We have an incredibly talented workforce, talented, wonderful people. Um, our policies just don't allow us to to grow. And in a lot of in a lot of ways, it's um, our government that's standing in the way. So we've been involved in discussions ranging from criminal justice reform to school choice to technology and innovation. And um, in my role in litigation um, at, at the Center for Justice, and uh, we're we we just look for ways that people can live a fulfilling life, um, that we can get um, any roadblocks out of the way, anything that doesn't truly protect people's people's health and safety. Um, anything that's that's keeping people from making a living, and that especially affects a lot of our, our disadvantaged uh, communities. So that's um, we we touch a lot of issues, and one of them in particular is um, is tax reform. And um, I'll mention that the big idea um, when it comes to tax reform is something that everybody can agree on from across the, the spectrum, left, right, and center, is that Louisiana's tax code is far too complex. It's it's not predictable. It's not um, accessible for, for, for companies that are thinking about coming here to do business. Um, the corporate tax code in Louisiana is 432 pages of carve outs and exceptions and uh, exemptions. To put that into contrast, the King James version of the Bible, the New Testament is 182 pages. So um, it's, it's a lot. It's um, the government picking winners and losers. And in a lot of ways, Louisiana is an outlier. We still have a franchise tax. Um, we still have inventory taxes. We are one of two states that does not have centralized sales tax collection yet. That's actually one of the bills that's um, being proposed this session to remedy that. So we are um, we're, we're an extreme outlier. And in a lot of cases, I was at a, a tax reform seminar a few weeks ago and um, one of the accountants who spoke mentioned that companies don't want to come here to do business because our, our tax code is so complex. They either need a lobbyist to go to the legislature and fight for a carve out or an exemption that suits their type of business, or they need an entire staff that can um, that can work on compliance here. Um, it's there are a lot of um, compliance problems. I understand from accountants. Um, it's it, and it, it's keeping people, it's keeping business, it's keeping Louisiana from from being an attractive an attractive place to do business. Um, our exemptions are so numerous. I mentioned that we have to keep our rates high in order to make up the difference. We can lower our corporate and inc individual income tax rates, um, provide the system that we have with some predictability, and collect the same amount of revenue. And our proposal is that we repeal the 2% um, income tax rate. That one would drop down to zero. We would lower the 6% bracket to 4%. And um, according to our um, economists, that would result in 1.145 billion in tax relief before you have an economic, before you even measure the economic growth in, uh, impact. So if we, simpl if we simplify our system, get rid of um, the, the picking of winners and, lo and losers, we can collect almost the same amount of taxes that we have, simplify the system and make it an attractive place to do business. And then the revenue, as we've seen in, um, in North Carolina, they've been at this for about 10 years now, it, the business and the revenue uh, would come. Um, there is actually a bill that would require a constitutional amendment. It's um, bill, House Bill 206. And it's um, Louisiana allows you to deduct your um, your federal taxes paid. Um, that ties Louisiana's fate to what's happening at the federal level. So um, that, like I said, that would require um, a constitutional amendment. That's going to be if it, if it passes, you need two thirds of it in the legislature. So that I think would be either this fall or, or the next um, when it would be on the ballot. So you can be on the lookout for that. A great resource to see how it's worded, if you aren't already already, already aware of this, is on the Public Affairs Research Council. Um, their PAR. And they usually put out a guide to the constitutional amendments every year. Um, if you, they break it down to if you vote yes, this is the effect it'll have. If you vote no, it'll have the following effect. 
Um, otherwise, um, our our um, corporate income tax, um, franchise tax, um, like I mentioned, these are these are compliance nightmares. Louisiana is out, an outlier, and the actually we we actually collect a very small amount of revenue um, relative to how high the tax rate is. Again, because of all of these exemptions, and we have a, a two pager that I, I'm happy to to drop in the the comment box as well. That probably explains it a lot better than I do. And uh, I think I mentioned before the centralized sales tax collection. We are one of two states that doesn't. Um, that, that doesn't have centralized sales tax collection. I forget how many entities there are, but it's it's something like 400 tax collecting entities in the state of Louisiana. There's 65 parishes. There's um, you know, one state. Um, I'm not sure how many how many you know. If, if you are um, a sheriff's office or a school board, um, it, it's it's done differently. Obviously, this creates compliance nightmares um, for businesses that are looking to to do to move here um, and. Uh, I think it was at this um, this conference I attended a few weeks ago, the Wayfair decision from the Supreme Court, if you're familiar with that, um, it's about sales tax collection for online purchases. That's going to create um, a problem. Hopefully Louisiana doesn't become a test case. Um, otherwise, uh, the bills that are being um, just, I just pulled a couple of them. Um, I know that there are, there's going to be a lot, um, but there is one to introduce cent centralized sales tax collection. There is uh, the income tax constitutional amendment. There is a bill to flatten the corporate income tax rates. There is one to flatten the individual income tax rates. And uh, there is a bill um, that, would that would reduce individual rates and brackets on the individual side. So um, I will put my contact information in there. Um, if, if anybody has any questions that I can't answer, I'm happy to, to direct you to the person at Pelican who can. But I really enjoyed um, the opportunity to, to speak with you guys, and um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much. I want to open it up via chat or verbally for any questions for Sarah. Okay, kind of a quiet group tonight. I think they're saving it for some of the agenda items a little bit further down on on our um, on the docket for tonight. But once again, Sarah, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially last minute. And um, I see you put your information up on in the chat here as well. And like I mentioned, for anyone who wants to come, maybe come back and review, this is being recorded, and we'll have it on the MCNO site. Thanks, Mindy. Right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I have with Orleans Public Schools, we have Olin Parker. Are you um, ready to present? All right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and give me one second and I will get my screen shared here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Is that all right? Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, uh, thank you everybody for having me. It is good to be back here with the Mid-City Neighborhood Organization. I am a former uh, member and chair of the organization. So I have been to many of these meetings. I was mainly involved uh, when Emily Leitzinger was president and the Graham Bosworth era. I caught the tail end of the Graham Bosworth era as well. Um, give me one minute. I have lost my, <laughs> so I, I see that I'm presenting, but I don't know where my tab went. <laughs> uh, let me see here. I'm going to stop presenting and find my tab again. There we go. Okay. Start presenting tab and there we go. Okay. So just a little bit, little bit about me. I was elected in the most, uh, during the same election as the presidential election. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I was a former chair of, of this esteemed organization. I'm very glad to be back. Uh, since swear, my swearing in in January, I was named the chair of the policy committee and I'm also a member of the charter accountability and finance committees. I have three kids that are in public schools here in New Orleans. You see them in that picture right there. 
uh, you are most likely to run into me running very slowly along Bank Street, uh, Norman Francis Street, Hennessy, and St. Patrick's. Uh, I will be moving slowly and wearing shorts that are too short, and so I apologize in advance. Uh, and if you want to follow me on social media to get uh, updates on a more regular basis, you can follow me at Vote Olin. So just to go kind of quickly here, um, it's loading, it's taking, okay. So I um, wanted to keep everybody up to date on items that are going on with uh, NOLA Public Schools. Regarding COVID-19, we have uh, the NOLA Public Schools Administration vaccinated over 3,000 teachers and staff through their own vaccine initiatives. Now, obviously other teachers were able to get vaccinated uh, either on their own or through other organizations that they belong to, but NOLA Public Schools was responsible for vaccinating over 3,000 individuals and really did an, an excellent job of uh, getting vaccines into teachers' arms as soon as they were available. Um, and at this point, every teacher and staff member in NOLA Public Schools, uh, uh, by the end of March, actually, any uh, any NOLA Public School staff member had the opportunity to receive one and most both shots of their vaccine. Uh, the, currently, there are four active staff cases and four active student cases across the entirety of NOLA Public Schools. And actually, I made this uh, PowerPoint this morning and the numbers were updated this afternoon. So there are actually only two active staff cases at this point. Uh, so our schools are doing an excellent job of enforcing PPE and the vaccinations have obviously helped. So I feel very confident in the safety of our teachers and staff. And um, we have not seen any evidence of in-school spread here in Orleans Parish, which is a real blessing. Um, I also uh, was very adamant that the district needed to, I felt like if we were going to require teachers to go back to school, that the district as the authorizer needed to monitor PPE use and make sure that schools were following CDC protocols. So since uh, we returned to schools in January, the district has been doing spot checks of schools to make sure that they are following public health guidance. Uh, and taking corrective action whenever it is not being followed. And overwhelmingly, uh, schools are remaining compliant with CDC guidelines, which obviously we love to see, and we're getting great results uh, because of the actions that our schools are taking. Uh, related to finance, like most public institutions, the Orleans Parish School Board and NOLA Public Schools uh, are going to take a big hit from COVID-19. We're continuing to assess the financial impact of it, uh, but we have, for this school year, we have lost roughly $50 per student, and uh, it could be up in the you know, hundreds of dollars, six to $700 per student for next school year. Now, uh, funds from the American Relief Plan and potentially the American Jobs Plan uh, will help sustain schools, uh, and, and we are still trying to figure out what the impact of those funds will be but uh, we are expecting from our state revenue and from our local tax revenue, a significant drop. I wanted to keep everyone uh, in this group abreast of the facilities renaming initiative, which is going on right now. Uh, the public feedback process began in, uh, in, February, uh, in February of this year. Uh, before I joined the board, the board passed a policy saying that we would rename any, any school building that was named after a segregationist, uh, someone who was involved in the Confederacy, or someone who owned slaves. And so that process is ongoing. There is an extensive community outreach process. We've already received you know, hundreds of emails about this. Uh, there is a list of schools. Uh, I think there are 16 schools that have been identified for renaming, either because, uh, because the person that the school is named after was a Confederate was aligned with the Confederacy or was a segregationist or was a slave owner. The full list is available on the NOLA Public Schools website, which is linked in my PowerPoint. And I will put the link in the update or in the chat window as soon as I'm done here. Um, to submit feedback on that list, you can simply email community at nolapublicschools.com with your thoughts. And those thoughts can either be, you know, I support this policy, I support the renaming of this school. It could be, I disagree with the renaming of this school. Or it could be, uh, I think we should rename a school after this person, and this is why I think we should name it after this person. 
I would like to point out that we currently in this city, as you might expect, have more um, schools named after men than women. And we don't have any schools named after someone of uh, Hispanic, Latinx uh, origin or indigenous uh, origin or uh, Asian or Asian American uh, heritage either. So as you're thinking of uh, potential names that might uh, you know, make sense to put on a school, I encourage you to think specifically about those groups as well because you know, I'm a firm believer that representation matters and I think a lot of people do as well. And we have a significant number of uh, obviously female and uh, Hispanic, Latinx uh, and Asian American students uh, you know, fewer indigenous students in the city, but you know, we all know the reasons for that. And uh, I think, you know, it makes total sense to, to honor that community as well. Uh, so again, if you have feedback, you can email community at nolapublicschools.com and you can also, uh, I have linked in here, a PowerPoint created by the district related to school reopening. Lastly, uh, the school district is also undergoing its strategic planning process. And there are a number of ways for the public to get involved, either via email or by, via focus group, or um, a, even a one-on-one -on -one interview with the team uh, that is uh, the team that is leading the strategic planning process. So I really encourage you, if you're invested in education, it, whether it's something that's, you know, uh, you know, something that's involving your home or your neighborhood or uh, just education in general, what you want to see for the city, please do get involved and click on this link and see all of the options that uh, you have in front of you for that. Just some upcoming items. I will go over this very quickly. We are currently uh, updating the charter contract template uh, for any school that was uh, renewed last fall. Their charter contract was renewed last fall. And I have uh, read every single line of those contracts, which was very boring and I do not recommend it. Uh, but uh, I, am, I have a particular eye towards making sure that our contracts are uh, one, as equitable as possible, uh, and two, making sure that our students are safe. And so there will be a few additions there um, that will be added to the charter contract template, which mainly uh, impacts how schools uh, interact with their students. And, and hopefully, you know, I'll have more information on that at a future meeting. Uh, we're also undergoing the evaluation process for the superintendent. Uh, and that will all be made public later this spring or early this summer as well. Uh, I've already mentioned the strategic planning process. There is a lot of thought right now, obviously, about returning to in-person learning in fall of 2021, what that's going to look like, what tutoring initiatives might look like, what after school opportunities or enrichment opportunities might look like, um, making sure that schools can afford to catch up on all the learning that has been lost in the 2020, 2021 school year. Um, and so I will continue to keep the organization updated on that as well. Uh, I'm currently visiting every school that's in the district, uh, most of which are in mid city. And I think I have four left. Uh, and then finally, if you have a, if you would like to attend a school board meeting, our next, uh, our we have a committee of the whole meeting on April the 20th at 1 p.m. and we have a full board meeting on April 22nd at 5:30. You're obviously, you know, welcome to input public comment on any issue, and the agendas for those meetings will be available on board docs. I believe that should be on Friday of this week. Uh, that concludes my update. I really appreciate y'all bearing with me as I am uh, solo parenting and trying to update here. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions for me, my contact information is below. Uh, and again, you can always find me on any social media platform except for TikTok, which I will not learn how to use uh, at Vote Olin. So I will turn it over, uh, Mindy, to you, and I will put a link for this PowerPoint in the chat. And I thank y'all for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just jump real quick. Um, Matthew with J Bank's office, do you um, have anything that you'd want to share or, or present before we get into the next couple of agenda items? I want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Matthew Schoenberger from Councilmember J.H. Banks' office. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Special Projects. Uh, thank you all so much for having this meeting. Yeah, Jenna, 
uh, was unavailable, so I just wanted to talk on a few quick things. Uh, first off, as everyone knows, um, you know, New Orleans right now is uh, kicking it into high gear uh, as it pertains to vaccines. Uh, basically, at this point, if you want a vaccine, you can get one. Uh, so we we highly recommend, uh, please, if anyone here has not gotten their vaccine, to please schedule to get one. It is now very easy. Uh, the convention center is doing it. Uh, pharmacies, uh, churches. I mean, there are uh, as many options as you could think of right now for anyone to get one. Uh, and our numbers have been um, absolutely fantastic. I mean, we are we are leading right now in vaccines. So it's it's a wonderful thing. Um, Council member Jeruso uh, briefly touched upon um, the Public Works Committee on Thursday. Uh, I highly recommend you all uh, tune into that and or submit a public comment for that. Uh, in particular, to pay attention to that um, FEMA project um, agenda item. I know uh, in particular, there have been a lot of complaints about the Mid-City Group A project, a lot of streets that were ripped up and never fixed. Um, I, I've had um, two or three residents from that area talk to our office about it. I know his office has heard about it. Uh, so all of these projects and miscommunications and problems will be discussed at that committee meeting. So please uh, check in on that. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a community development committee meeting uh, from our office. That's at 10 a.m. The agenda has been posted uh, 24 hours in advance. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, you can check that out. Um, there was a, kind of a significant thing that, that passed during the last, um, I'm sorry, not the last, but, but the, uh, the council meeting on the 25th of March, uh, which had to do with safe exchange zones. So during that uh, council meeting, it was resolution R-21-114, urging NOPT to designate clearly marked safe exchange zones at district stations. And if anyone doesn't know, this was in response to that tragedy that happened uh, to Joseph Vendell. He was a New Orleans resident uh, who was doing an online transaction uh, and meeting someone, I believe, in Jefferson Parish, and he was murdered. So. Um, um, I know Jefferson Parish established some safe exchange zones, and um, now New Orleans is establishing them. So we passed the resolution. Um, Superintendent Ferguson said that um, they are going to be setting them up uh, in every police district except currently, I think, one in eight because they don't have the capacity to do it yet, but they're trying to see uh, what they can do to fix that. Um, I don't know if they're set up yet. But I know they were in the process of doing that. Uh, we might also um, have him present at a future uh, criminal justice committee meeting to give an update on that. So um, those are the updates I wanted to give. Well, I appreciate you joining us and um, and with all all the information and the updates, some good stuff there. Um, so so last week, I, I believe not last week. Sorry, I believe last meeting we um, had a very robust discussion about the Mercy Lindy Boggs building and um, St. Margaret's. Um, the representative Heather McGowan, um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced her last name. Um, she joined us last last meeting, and she's here again. But I want to just give the floor over. I have a feeling there are going to probably be some more questions or comments. So once again, verbally or in the chat. Um, and I will I'll get to them as they come up. But Heather, thanks again for joining us um, for this second meeting. And I will mute myself and turn it over to you for any updates or anything that you may have to share. Great. I'm glad to be here again. Um, I know you guys just heard from me, but we would like to keep a more open, frequent line of communication with the community because um, I know everyone's anxious for updates and information. So happy to participate in that process um, on a more regular basis. Um, just you know, two quick things I wanted to mention and then I'll open it up for questions. I know as many of you are probably aware, um, there was highly offensive um, anti-AAPI graffiti that appeared at the top of one of the towers um, on the Lindy Boggs building over the past few weeks. And we got that removed you know, as quickly as, as we could. Um, I believe within, it was about a week, a little longer, um, a few days longer. 
Um, but we do take that very seriously. And I know that sometimes it, it really feels like controlling the graffiti at the site is an impossible task, but we do really want the community to know that we take the, the racist and offensive graffiti very, very seriously, and we will continue to act as quickly as we can to make sure um, that we quickly address all instances of you know racist messaging and obscenities um, as quickly as possible. Uh, and I know Chris has my contact information, you know, my email address and um, and my phone number. Um, so, you know, please uh, reach out with any concerns there. Um, I also know that, um, you know, we had a lot of rainfall over the last week and into the weekend and it is a collection of rainwater in the basement area is a concern of the community. Um, it, the basement um, does have a good bit of rainwater in it, um, so made some phone calls today. We're trying to get that pumped out um, as soon as we can. It just uh, It's a lot of coordination to get the labor out there to get it pumped, but um, we'll make sure that gets done um, in an expeditious manner. And um, we are looking at you know more long-term permanent automatic solutions. It's just a challenge um, given the nature of the site um, right now. So that's really all I have for you guys tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, I'll turn it over to Mindy again. Do you, is it okay if I put your contact um, email into the chat? Yes, of course. Get more comfortable and multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, welcome any questions or um, you know, via chat or anything for Heather. Heather, this this is Bob Rivard. Uh, is there any chance that you can regularly patrol that area for trash? There's there's a trash can that's been on its side for three weeks now, uh, and 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 it's got trash spewing out of it. I, I don't know the purpose of that. And there's also holes in the fence, so. Of course, people are going in because that's not, any, yes. you know, if there was any regular maintenance, that would help a lot. And and the second question is, do you think we can ever get Larry Stansberry before MCNO meeting? <laughs> Larry, well, to answer your second question first, yes, Larry would be um, happy to appear if, if you want to hear from him. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you would be um, more than happy to appear so I can put him um on the agenda, of course. Um, in terms of the maintenance, it is it's a source of frustration for us as well. Um, and I mentioned some of this on the, the last meeting. Um, I really thought that the landscaping company that we pay to maintain the site hadn't been out there. Um, and it, it really turns out that, you know, within three days of them having been out there, it really looked like people had gone back and dumped more trash all over the place. And I would have sworn that the crew had not been out there, but for the fact that I had pictures, you know, showing it up. Um, we are, this is, um, I believe the last month of the, the current um, vendors contracts. And we're in the process of redoing that to provide for more regular um, cleanup of the grounds. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll see more, but again, given my last experience with the trash pickup and the fact that it, it came back, um, you know, so quickly, um, you know, I, I do hope it makes an improvement because um, I know that it's frustrating. We also, we also spent a good bit of money having the fence um, sections of it replaced and repatched. Um, that was also, uh, hey, less than two months ago for sure um and the problem with the fencing is that they cut new holes in it constantly so we're constantly patching um and you know relocking things and um it just you know we're we are trying um i know everyone wishes that we could do more we wish we could have more of an impact in controlling that um but you know i do want you to know that we we're not ignoring the problem it's it's just very challenging um so we're you know really the the answer is we need now that covid is knock on wood in the past and we're seeing more of the vaccine rollout um really take off speed and really seeing tremendous improvements and more opening up in the financial markets um we need to make progress on the development 
investment side. We need a financial closing, um, hopefully, you know, end of this year, or early next with, you know, HUD is the most likely scenario for um, the financing for the new development. And, you know, I think with that, um, you know, that's, that's really what's going to make a difference. And can, can you commit to at least St. Margaret's getting rid of the residential trash can that they can't even keep standing up? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that I would take 10 that, minutes. I will make a call. <laughs> I will make a call about that residential trash can. And um, for insurance purposes, I just, I can't send anyone out there. Um, it, technically, it is it is a different entity than St. Margaret's, um, the home, and we do have a co-owner there. So the lawyer in me has to tell you that, you know, I can't just send anyone out there, but I will make sure, yes, that the trash can is um, taken away. Um, Larry absolutely. could do it. <laughs> He might he might take you up on that. Um, oh, good, good. But I, know he, he, that. I think he would not be a, a, a risk to. Uh, yeah, much. the trash can is crazy, and I, I mean, I remember that you know they brought a lawn chair back, you know, within a few days after the last you know site cleanup, and if we, the grounds cleanup has been there a couple times since, and um, you know, it, I agree. I'm sorry. I apologize. You're going to find I'm social sorry. media pictures soon. <laughs> I'm sorry, you what? You're going to find social media pictures soon. Of, of the, I've taken pictures several times in the last two weeks, and there's no uh -huh. changes. So, okay. you know, unless they want to see that, then I would, something needs to be done. I brought it. Something will be done. Um, do. We'll definitely take care of that one. All right, thank you. Um, I want to get moving um, on. I know there's already been a little bit of um, Facebook chatter since we posted it this morning um, and get on to our next presenter. But just really quickly, I also want to address and acknowledge that there were some concerns with the MPP meeting on Saturday for the 217 South Rendon plan development. Um, we are going to talk about that in the next meeting so that we can have a, like, a more robust conversation. Um, and we will publish once the docket number is assigned and public comment has been submitted. Uh, once again, we will discuss more thoroughly in the next meeting. And um, if you would like to stay updated, um, there is a, a, a NOLA.gov website that you can um, that you can go to and it can help you give you as a resource. It's noticeme.nola.gov. And in a second, I will throw that into the chat. So I just want to acknowledge that. I know there was a lot of concerns and we will discuss next next meeting. Um, so on that note, we do have, um, we have I have Avery, uh, Avery Foray here, and she is going to talk to us about the NPP announcement we made this morning about the um, location on Tulane and Carrollton with the Chick-fil-A. So um, Avery, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to mute myself again and give you the floor. Great, thank you, Mindy. I hope you guys can hear me all right. Um, Avery Foray, I'm a local land use consultant uh, and I'm joined today by Patrick Davis with uh, Restaurant Development with Chick-fil-A. Um, we want to bring uh, what we think is an exciting site. Um, as mentioned in that agenda, we do have an NPP uh, date set for two weeks from today. We set two times just to try to get um, you know to as many people as we can. So we have a noon time and a six o'clock time. Um, so I will try to be brief tonight, but happy to answer as many questions as you all have. Um, so the site is uh, Tulane and Carrollton. I'm going to maybe present my screen here. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm more used to Zoom, so bear with me. Uh, it's the old Burger King site, as I'm sure you'll remember. It just uh, the Burger King closed about last summer. Um, can you see the screen, the site plan? Okay. Fantastic. Again, apologies. I'm not used to this platform. Um, so this is the site. Uh, because it has a history of fast food and a drive through there, we thought it was a great selection um, in Mid-City. We're at the very beginning of our conditional use process. So uh, like I just mentioned, we'll have an NPP in two weeks and then make a submittal for conditional use. Um, you know, there is the option to use the existing building and retrofit it and the existing site retain that existing nonconformity. 
Um, but for reasons that we kind of laid out in the letter, it, it's, it's just not ideal. Um, this is a more efficient layout for the traffic for Chick-fil-A. Um, that way they can modernize the building. And then, you know, going through this conditional use process, uh, we believe as a firm always ends up in a, a better result um, and a better product. So uh, I guess with that, I will turn it over to Patrick if he has anything to add. And, and again, we're happy to answer questions, but I know we're at the end of a, of a long meeting. Sure. Thanks, Avery. Now, I just want to chime in and just say uh, we're excited to be coming to the neighborhood and to the community. Again, my name is Patrick Davis. Um, I'm the principal development lead for Chick-fil-A Corporate here um, in the kind of covering the uh, the Southwest region, which is all of Louisiana. And um, we're just really excited to be in Orleans Parish, um, coming to Orleans Parish for the first time with a couple of deals, particularly this one here um, on Carrollton and Tulane. So, uh, again, Love to answer any questions you all will have um, as we, uh, uh, you know, kind of take the steps to, to become a, a part of the community. So, could we have a question here in the chat. It says, "What will be the, will be the starting rate of pay?" Uh, so that's a good question. So um, the, the rate of pay is, is up to the, the owner operator who will be uh, operating there locally. Um, we don't dictate that at, uh, at corporate, but I, I will say typically the rate of pay is, is, is higher than minimum wage. Um, and, and we pay typically Chick-fil-A pays, um, you know, uh, kind of on the higher end of, of other QSR restaurants. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I just want to kind of put this out there. We don't normally have a very shy group, but I don't want anyone to feel like they are um, have any time constraints. The, the meeting is scheduled until 730. I promise not to keep you all until 730. Um, but I did just want to be able to give anybody the opportunity that has a question to please ask it or a concern. Um, I will go out and just say that just some of the things that I've seen so far and then also from obviously living in the neighborhood traffic is going to be a huge concern so um so here's a question here what is the direction of traffic as it leaves the site and actually if you have any other information regarding the traffic and um i think that might be a good idea to share yeah so um for the most part so as you can see on this site plan there's there's kind of two entrances um, um and exit points on the site uh most of the traffic will will be directed to two lane um, in full transparency, the owner operator has the ability, we try to give them the flexibility to close off um, a particular entrance or exit during their high peak time um, hours. And um, I'm pretty sure probably during the uh, during his high peak times, he'll probably close off the Carrollton entrance um, and use that maybe as an exit only. Uh, but as you can see in our in our in this particular layout, this is a drive through only locations so there will um there will be no um, inside dining and uh the just the efficiency that our, our drive through uh and the way that it moves um we, we feel fairly confident that we'll be able to get um all of our customers on and off the site in a timely manner without impacting traffic on Carrollton and Tulane. Um as you can see our, our drive through currently is showing um over our 30 30 car stack and then we have uh, additional room to stack probably an additional 20 or some odd cars on the on the lot without it actually spilling out into two lanes. So we feel really good about this particular layout. So I just want to I think maybe rephrase something that you may have said. Um, is there is going to it looks like there's going to be two drive through lanes. Um, that is correct. So that Those will help mitigate some of the back um, backlog. Yes. I'm sorry if I cut someone off. Do you have since someone have another question? Uh, this is Thomas Decker. Uh, this is not a dine-in restaurant. It's only drive-through, kind of like the idea of a rallies or a checkers. Uh, yes, it's drive-through only. So there, there will be no inside dining. There is uh, a few patio um, seats um, that you'll see there uh, for you know if someone wants to just sit there on the patio and eat their food. But uh, but yeah, the, the, this restaurant will be a drive-through only. How are you going to serve that that outer lane? Uh, <laughs> So, again, so our our our, uh, our our team members actually are pretty efficient. Uh, currently, I don't know if you've um, visited any restaurants that that currently have our dual lane drive-through setup, but 
we're really doing this across the country now um, and amped it up really kind of during COVID um, where our team members are, are serving both lanes um, at the window as well as serving several cars upstream. And then we also have um, uh, team members out at the order point um, taking orders, um, not not necessarily at a call box, if you will, but um, at the car and also upstream. So um, it's a pretty efficient operation. Are they are they taking into account the inclement weather that that is pervasive in southeast Louisiana for these workers who have to work outside? Uh, yes. So our canopies, um, we have uh, canopies as a part of our new uh, design standard and prototype where there's canopies that co that covers the both the odor point and the meal delivery point and those canopies are um uh have uh fans uh for, for air conditioning as well as heaters and uh, i asked the rate of pay thing the rate of pay in Louisiana is seven dollars and twenty-five cents. You could say I'm higher than the lowest rate of pay at seven fifty. It's still paltry, and no paltry pun intended. But the uh, can they do better than that? I mean, at least twelve dollars an hour start pay. Make it more competitive. I, I, I so again, the the rate of pay is is totally up to the local owner operator that would be selected for this particular restaurant. But I I, I can assure you um, that it, it will be above the the seven fifty. Um, just the the average pay within you know within Chick Fil A restaurants is, is is above that. And, and let me let me also say this um, just to answer some other questions around. You know, when we come to a community, you know, a typical restaurant brings anywhere from 70 to 100 um, uh, well-paying jobs. Uh, that That is uh, for, you know, for staff members. In addition to that, there are typically somewhere around 10 to 15 manager level um, job opportunities, which um, are, um, uh, are, 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 are I would say kind of mid to uh, mid manager level uh, pay as well um, that you would see in, in any uh, substantial operation. Um, and so, uh, again, I, I think, you know, when we come to a community, we, we come to bring opportunity. Our, our operators also um, are very engaged in, um, uh, you know, providing uh, meals for different uh, community organizations as it relates to um, food banks and things of that nature. They give away tens of thousands of dollars of way of food each year. And so, so again, we're excited to kind of bring that type of engagement to the, to the local community there. Okay, we do have one more, another question in the chat. Um, the question is, have traffic studies been conducted? Uh, again, we are early in the process. Um, uh, so we have not completed our traffic impact analysis yet, but uh, that is part of the process. And then can you just repeat again um, when the NPP meetings are um, just? Sure, they're um, April 26th, one at noon and one at six o'clock. And um, I'll make sure that Zoom link is, I'll, I'll actually just put the Zoom link in the chat. So everybody has access to it, but I'm happy to share it any other way too, as well. Um, I, without going right back to the Facebook page, I believe we posted it today. So the information should be on the MCNO Facebook page as well. Um, for those of you, um, a little bit ease of access. Okay. Any other questions? These are really great questions. As I mentioned, like I said, you're going to see more and more about the traffic. That, that's already been what, what's bubbled up. So, um, you know, but this is your opportunity here if you have a question or a concern to share it. Okay. This is, this is Thomas Ecker once more. They're having people who were on the, when it was mentioned in the, uh, on, on the Facebook group, they were concerned about the anti-LGBT donation uh, stigma that is hovering over Chick-fil-A altogether. How do y'all plan to address that? So again, um, that's, that's a great question, fair question. Um, we get asked that question um, quite often. Uh, and 
you know, our Chick-fil-A foundation is, is really adamant about giving to youth, uh, particularly around um, education. Um, there were a couple of organizations um, that I think came into question a couple of years ago. And specifically those organizations, um, the, the contributions to those organizations were centered around um, youth education. One was for a youth camp uh, and another one was for uh, a bike drive. Um, but again, you know, Chick-fil-A is um, equal opportunity employer. We're heavily engaged in the communities that we are um, that we are a part of. And uh, again, our, our contributions are, are really, truly solely focused on on youth, education, poverty um, and, and kind of solving homelessness and things of that nature. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. OK, um, as you can see, the information is, is in the chat. Once again, this has will is being recorded and will be posted later on. Um, so thank Patrick and Avery. Thank you again for joining and um, a lot of great information. And, and you know, and hopefully as, as we go through through the process, more information will come out and, you know, others will have more opportunity to ask more questions. But we highly encourage you, um, you all, especially if you have again, questions or concerns to join that MPP meeting. You know? Um, I know we're at 711. I just want to give a very quick nod to Stephen Mossgrove from the Neighborhood Engagements. If you have any have anything that you would like to share. Yeah, thanks, Mindy. I, I appreciate that. Just briefly, I, I want to kind of affirm Matthew's um, information about vaccinations um, and, and leave you all with a couple of um, uh, points of contact and, and perhaps a call to action. Um, you know, as Matthew indicated, uh, the parishes, the city's uh, vaccination process is going well. But just a few months ago, the, the challenge. You went mute. You Sorry, guys. I thought uh, I thought I had successfully pressed it. Um, appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to kind of affirm briefly. Uh, Matthew's uh, points about vaccinations. Um, you know, a few months ago, the the challenge in the state and and the country was supply. Now, the the challenge is demand um, within the city uh, for those vaccinations, and we're doing well. Forty percent of uh, Orleans Parish adults. Uh, have had at least one uh, one dose, one shot, uh, and 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 so we're slightly uh, above the the national and state averages uh, in a number of categories um, related to COVID, um, and have been over uh, over some months. Um, but there are two things I want to tonight is so, um, these Nola ready, uh, 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 you know. Um, I want to encourage you to do that by texting COVID NOLA uh, and, and text COVID NOLA to 888-777. And the reason I encourage that, and I'm sure many if there's if there if you can message other folks themselves uh, to that update texting system, um, please do so that NOLA has recently is vaccine availability uh, hey Stephen I'm really sorry but you keep cutting in and out with the mute I don't know what's happening yeah I might I might I might I'm sorry about that um I'm not sure what did you how, how long ago did you lose me or did I lose y'all about 30 seconds ago you're talking uh, about uh texting okay so I let me move away. It might be my shirt or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to stress if you're if you're not following the NOLA ready text updates, uh, please do so or encourage others to do so. Um, you can you can you can connect there by going to COVID NOLA or inputting COVID NOLA to eight 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 seven seven seven. The reason I'm encouraging. Uh, you all to do that and or to spread the word uh, to, to family, friends, neighbors, associates 
um, is is that NOLA Ready is now doing updates um, about vaccine availability. Uh, and you know, just weeks ago, you know, you had to make an appointment. Sometimes, um, you know, there was some some difficulty getting an appointment a couple of months ago. Um, and 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 now there's so much supply, uh, uh, you know, overwhelming demand that you know the convention center is taking walk-ins. Uh, other suppliers are taking walk-ins. So the NOLA Ready system is notifying people of that. Just want to encourage folks to 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 be informed in that way. Um, again, if you've been vaccinated, maybe it's an opportunity to share that information with someone who might not be as plugged in. And I know Miss City is always. Um, very generous and, and, and you have a number of advocates and y'all always get your, your hands, uh, you know, y'all, y'all, y'all don't mind a clean up and getting active and, and, and helping folks out. The second thing related to COVID vaccinations is more that call of action that I mentioned probably when I was muted. Um, but there are neighborhoods um, within District A and within the city that are, their vaccination rates are not particularly high. Um, and in District A, we're looking at Holly Grove, Holly Grove Dixon, and Tulane Gravier. Now, Tulane Gravier is part of the Mid City family. Um, and so um, the city and our, our health department and our emergency preparedness um, office, and our office, Mayor's Neighborhood Engagement Office, is working to um, increase rates throughout every neighborhood in the city, uh, particularly those in District A, as well as Girt Town, which is right across South, South Carrollton into District B. Um, and so we're looking to do some outreach, particularly with residents from those neighborhoods. That's very important. Um, but if there's an opportunity for uh, you all, like I said, who, you know, y'all MCNO typically gets very active. Uh, if there's an opportunity for, for you to volunteer to canvas the, the low vaccination rate neighborhoods, and to really encourage people uh, to do so, or if you have associates who you think would be good at, at canvassing and spreading the message, um, I wanna encourage y'all to, to sign up at ready.nola.gov forward slash canvas. Ready.nola.gov forward slash canvas. So that's really what I wanted to stress tonight. Um, you know, the vaccination is, is really our way of getting through the, the, the public health component of the pandemic, as well as getting to um, our economy uh, standing up and, 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 and coming back stronger um, than, it, than it was. So, um, you know, we really need to reach that herd immunity. There are challenges with hesitancy uh, and things of that nature. Right now it's kind of running, we're running and gunning, but we're starting to reach, reach that point where, you know, the, the, the hesitancy of citizens or their lack of information about accessibility and, and comfort levels will um, will perhaps slow down the vaccination rate success. Um, so please make that an important part of your 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 civic your civic thinking um, over the next couple of months, not today and and over the next couple of months. So, Mindy, I appreciate the time uh, and and great meeting tonight. Fantastic. You bet. Did we, did someone have a question? I do see that there was a question in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Claire um, was kind enough to respond, um, but just in case anyone's curious, it says, does anyone from the city council office or any other office have an update or information about the large increase in the car break-in and stealing activity? Um, so I'll just read this real quick just for certainty. Um, and so this is from Claire. She does work for Jerusalem's office. She said um, when they met with Bayou St. John and Mid-City residents Friday about the rising carjackings, um, Russo is a frequent communication with NOPD about this issue since the council is the allocating body. I know he is invested in both preventative programs as well as diversion electronic monitoring services to keep people out of the prison pipeline. There is also district attorney and NOPD apparently have a plan to target these crimes. And there's a link there. I did uh, abbreviate just a little bit um, with some of the commentary, but it is there fully in the in the chat as, as long, along with the link there. So Claire, thank you so much for stepping in and, and answering that for us. Thank you, Mindy. Appreciate it. 
If there are no other questions, um, just a quick, very quick um, update. The next, our next meeting is Monday, uh, next neighborhood meeting is Monday, May 10th. It's going to be virtual again at 6 p.m. We are um, going to be looking at trying to get back together in person really soon. Um, and then the next MCNO board meeting is gonna be um, Tuesday, April 27th, also um, remote at 6 p.m. So thank you all for joining us this after this evening. And any questions, again, send them over info at mcno.org. And uh, once again, we'll have this posted probably, I don't know, maybe tonight or tomorrow. So thank you all for joining. Thanks, Bendy. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.